The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Superwoman Wellness, where we're always trying to educate and bring you back to your superpowered self. So today I have an esteemed physician with an incredible career here to tell you all about it and for us to learn and be inspired of ways that we can contribute as we move through our own careers. Dr. Lloyd Setterer is a psychiatrist and a public health doctor who is held among the most prestigious jobs in his field. He's been medical director of a Harvard teaching hospital, a mental health commissioner of New York City, chief medical officer for mental health for New York as well, and medical editor for mental health and for the Huffington Post. His is an improbable life, which is his new book, his 13th book. Is that right? Is that your 13th book? Good grief. Reveals his stories from his youth with an essay about their relevance to our lives today. What an interesting time to bring you on when we're sitting here in the middle of this global pandemic. Welcome to the show, Dr. Setterer, but I'm going to call you Lloyd. Welcome. Please. Uh, And thank you. Thank you for having me and for, and I appreciate the mission that you're on. And so I feel privileged to join you. Thank you. Well, tell us a little bit about, I have a million questions for you, but tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write your latest book, which is An Ink Stained Life. What inspired that? And a little bit about your journey and your story as you've uh, navigated all these different roles. Well, like many doctors in university settings for a long time, I wrote professional papers, journals, a batch of textbooks, And uh, then I uh, went into public service for my first job in government was as mental health commissioner in New York City in the Bloomberg administration. Oh, wow. Okay. That's when you could get stuff done. And um, uh, and after a while in uh, public service, I realized that what I was publishing was reaching hardly anybody. Uh, you know, who picks up a medical journal, or maybe we do once in a while, but it's an abstract. Right. And, uh, or we have to read one for something. Uh, but instead, I thought, well, uh, what about writing for the general public? Uh, because after all, that's where uh, our information, our experience, our learning uh, is best applied uh, mm-hmm. and it's trustworthy. And uh, there are a lot of stories that I had to tell uh, in public service and before. So about uh, 10, 11 years ago, I stopped writing professionally, um, stopped, but I shifted to writing for the lay public. Mm -hmm. And I began uh, pretty quickly and uh, I seemed to, uh, it, I, I liked it and it seemed to interest people. And I suddenly had lots and lots of momentum in that area. That's how I got uh, brought on to the Huff Post. And, um, what, uh, and I loved doing it. And I actually began teaching it uh, at Columbia. Uh, mm-hmm. This is, we just finished our 17th sequential uh, semester teaching uh, medical writing for the lay public. Wow. Every time. So uh, I thought after all this, what was I doing? I never had no training or anything, but there was this legendary uh, writer journalist named Bill Zinser, and he held a workshop on writing uh, at the New School in New York, which was near uh, where I lived and I, uh, in the evening. And I went to that workshop and it was 20, 30 assorted you know, New Yorkers, and uh, the the drill was that we were to bring uh, things we wrote, not publish brand new, uh, 800 words or so, and read them before the class and invite uh, commentary. And, and so I did, and I wrote this piece that was about 700 words called Ink Stained for Life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was a story about being an eight-year-old boy, my being an eight-year-old boy, being shaken out of my sleep by my father at, on weekend mornings very early to go with him to work in the family business, which mm-hmm. was a dictionary store in Westchester at that time. We were living in the Bronx. And I told that story and uh, that night. And um, the, the group seemed particularly interested and in, uh, uh, involved. And then Zinser, uh, who uh, is not given to being gratuitous, 
a legendary guy, sold a million books, called on writing well. Um, he, he said, perfect. And, and I think it shocked everybody. Wow, yeah. So emboldened, I sent that piece the very next day to the New York Times. Okay. Uh, and the very day after that, they sent me back a note saying, we'll take it. And then on Saturday morning, it was up. And um, that was, you know, one of the things about writing online is the immediacy of uh, mm -hmm. the uh, reward. Uh, you write for a journal and maybe a year or, year or more, yeah, right. uh, now a little bit earlier because of online, before you know that your piece, is, you even forgot what you wrote about that time. Whereas it's uh, almost instantaneous with uh, writing in, on uh, certain uh, websites and, and uh, services. So um, I did that in 2010. And then okay. I continued to write, and I began writing uh, not just articles, uh, Huff Post. I wrote opinion column for U.S. News, batch of stuff, and I, and I started writing movie, book, and TV reviews because I was interested in that. I wrote six hundred of them. Yeah. So, uh, so I, um, but uh, I put aside, but none of them was memoir, uh, and. Uh, but I befriended uh, since we would go to lunch regularly and um, uh, and then he died uh, and in 2018, two years ago, I was on a long drive uh, from Albany, the state capital, and I, he has one set of three CDs where he talks about his work and mm -hmm. Most of it is on writing well, but a little bit, a bit of it is on memoir. So I listened to that for the first time as I was driving and suddenly I couldn't, I had this itch that had to be scratched. I had, I picked up that first story in Stain, the only one that I had. And for the next uh, two, in the next two weeks, I wrote 13 more stories, one every evening. Wow. And it was all there. I, I mean, I never imagined I had all this recall as a boy and this experience. And that, because it's about family, family businesses. It's about bullying, intelligence, rich people, Jewish people, yep. enterprise. Uh, that's what the stories are about. So, uh, uh, so I just had to go inside and I wrote 13 more stories. And I called, I emailed my publisher uh, because I had a two book deal from my last book, Addiction, uh, on addiction, and uh, said, you have right of first refusal. That was in my contract. And she said, what do you got? And I said, I have 19, uh, I have 14 stories. Uh, and, and then she asked, how many words? And I said, 19,000 words. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, that's nothing. So she said, you can come back to me with a book with 19,000 words after you win a Pulitzer Prize. Oh, wow. And the reason for that, I learned quickly, is that the book industry hurts a lot. And they have to sell a book for 26 or $27 in order to uh, survive. Right. And, and a little book, 19,000 words, which is maybe a hundred uh, pages or something like that. Uh, you have to be a celebrity or have a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, so I read that and I was disappointed. I was angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I dusted myself off after a few days and I thought, well, how can I make the book better and longer. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, why I wrote an essay uh, to accompany uh, each story, an essay about what it's about and what it means today. And uh, that took me a year, not 14 oh. days. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then I had a book that was uh, 58,000 words over the threshold. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in business again. Excellent. And is that Ink Stain Life? Is that book with your stories and with your yeah. lessons? This is, this right there. Well, let's talk about some of the lessons because as we talk today, you know, you're a public, a public health doctor, you know, we've got a pandemic going on right now. You're also a mental health, you know, prominent mental health physician as well. 
where not only do we have the infectious disease component of what's happening, but we also have a mental health crisis that was bad, but more than likely is getting worse. What are some of the lessons we can pull maybe from your experience and from your life as people try to adapt and move forward? What are, what are your, some, of, some of your thoughts about what's going on? It's a great question. Um, I also, when I was uh, working for the city and the state, led uh, major uh, post-disaster mental health responses after 9-11 in New York City and mm -hmm. uh, after Hurricane Sandy, others as well. And with each of those, um, I had obtained a very large federal grant uh, to do that. And I got very close to the experience of people um, after major disaster. And there were some, uh, some things that were very clear. One is that distress was ubiquitous, particularly after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Sandy, it was a little bit more localized. It was everywhere. And we had to emphasize that it's normal to feel anxious in an abnormal situation. Mm, I love that. that yeah. people, people aren't sick. They're distressed. Some of them have symptoms severe enough, persistent enough to be considered to have a, an illness, depression, a trauma, disorder, whatnot. But almost all of New York at that time was traumatized. And we, uh, we, we had all kinds of messages, public uh, PSAs with the side of a bus, and we were trying to convey to people that message and that the major finding from our studies then and other disasters is that people are resilient that people, that our race, our, our civilization our, uh, is, um, is resilient. And uh, what predicts mm -hmm. recovery and what uh, predicts uh, real problems afterwards? Yeah. And we were able to isolate those elements. So for example, uh, and this is bearing on how people need to behave today, to, recover. Yeah. It, the biggest thing is support, support, support. Um, that you need human contact. And the irony of this disaster is that we're supposed to stay socially isolated. So it makes it more of a, uh, a troubling disaster because the very things that people need, which is to be close to people they care about, who care about them, Mm -hmm. and shut off. So the message there is over communicate. Right. Over. So don't be hesitant about calling. Don't be hesitant about more Zoom meetings. Uh, don't be hesitant about going for a walk outside and mm -hmm. socially dis. You have to work at human contact because it is medicine, medicine for uh, post disaster. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we, we learned is that Many people, like you and me, for example, our routines have been disrupted. We used to get up, go someplace, um, be there for a while, come home, stop at the grocery. And uh, now uh, we're at home. And many people are some, unfortunately, because they're out of work. And uh, their uh, routine is important. It is important to get up at a certain time, to shower, to not get out of your pajamas or your sweats or whatever you sleep in, to uh, have patterns of eating and patterns of contacting other structure, routine helps a lot. And one of the findings that was the most interesting was a great predictor of resilience is faith. Mm. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a organized religion. Uh, for many people, it is, but for many others, including myself, um, it is a, a spiritual sense within us, a uh, appreciation, a deep appreciation that we're part of a larger whole uh, connected universe, um, even however transient our moment is on earth. And that faith is important during uh, the, the time of disaster because it helps us stay the course. 
it helps us even in a protracted post-disaster mm -hmm. situation, which is what we're living now, it helps us appreciate that there is light ahead, that we can have faith about that. The people have survived for thousands and thousands of years this way, and we will too, and that's faith. And uh, so find it in you, uh, nourish it, uh, go to, uh, go to the woods or go to the church or wherever you go that, uh, that uh, energizes that spirituality, that faith in you. So when I was doing my integrative uh, medicine fellowship, one of the things, and this comes from Eastern systems of medicine too, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, they very much connected uh, faith and the spirit with Shen, right? With the, which is your mindset and how you're gonna see forward and the meridian theory went with that and all this other stuff. That I won't bore everybody with, but you know, anxiety, depression, ADHD, OCD, bipolar disorder. Talk about what you see happening. I know we've got a pandemic right now, so that's that's the big thing. But talk about what was already happening. You know, even pre-pandemic, with the rise in this those disorders, is that because in these Eastern systems of medicine, they say we get divorced from our faith. They say we get divorced from our spirit. And that sort of separation from the spirit leads to a mind in chaos. And now, you know, that's a lot of Eastern medicine talk, but as somebody who's, you know, been a Harvard, you know, mental health uh, director and all this other stuff, tell us what you've seen in practice and, and if you agree with that to a certain extent. I think there is good evidence that <clears throat> disorders, uh, depressive disorders, anxiety are occurring earlier. Uh, and more persistent. Um, I don't know if that's true of bipolar disorder or, mm. or uh, severe uh, psychotic illness, schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people say that's because we're better at detecting it. People are more ready to come forward. Um, but I, I think it's more than that. And there has been a breakdown of family, a breakdown of community a breakdown of trust in institutions, whether mm -hmm. they're um, uh, institutions of faith, uh, education, and uh, these have very powerful uh, and destructive effects on, we, uh, on any and all of us. And those are the risk factors mm. for um, developing a disease or uh, having a relapse into a disease. Uh, uh, and particularly substance use disorders. We saw this post uh, those, both those disasters that if you had a pre-existing substance disorder, alcoholism, uh, used opioids, mm -hmm. um, you were at very high risk um, for that to happen again because you were uh, already on thin ice, so to speak. And then you have this distress and then you have all these difficulties in living economically financially uh being close to other people mm -hmm. and you relapse uh, and the what that meant uh to we in the service uh medical service business uh is you have to be better at identifying who's been ill and who's at risk to get ill again they're your most vulnerable population, just like the elderly are with uh, COVID. And a good uh, safety net, uh, medical social safety net reaches out to those people uh, because they won't reach out to us. And that's a way of helping them realize that this is a time of risk. What are they doing to try to uh, uh, maintain their recovery or maintain their uh, mental stability. Uh, what do they need to be in treatment again? So it is a matter of uh, early detection and uh, that is possible. Uh, it's possible increasingly uh, in primary care uh, as primary care becomes much more uh, appreciative of the fact that well, a third or more of the, of the patients that come into their office have an existing mental disorder, particularly mm. depression, anxiety, yeah. and substance disorder. And so uh, the routine use of uh, screening tools, 
you know, nine questions for depression, yeah. seven for anxiety, uh, is a little bit on the way to becoming a standard operating procedure in primary care. Just like when you and I go in, we have our blood pressure taken, we have our pulse taken, uh, we have our weight taken, we have uh, blood levels of lipids and uh, hemoglobin and A1C. These are routine screening tests and they need to exist with mental disorders because they're actually more frequent than uh, diabetes. That is fascinating because I know the primary care setup today, I mean, again, our practice is very different. We spend a lot of time with folks and we use all these methodologies to pull this information literally out of them because I can show them like, well, this is what Chinese medicine says. This is what Ayurveda says. This is what your labs say. This is what I'm picking up from you. And we can show them like, hey, are you, are you having these issues? You know, but the average primary care physician doesn't have that time, right? They're running through these rooms, you know, you know, I, we were speaking in the beginning of like, my hope is that we'll see some evolution in medicine with the way we deliver primary care because it is a relationship. Yes. And the, the sort of disruption of that relationship has led to, I think, a lot of bad outcomes and the practice of a system where a lot of people are really just disheartened and the physicians are getting burned out left and right because many of us went into the field for that relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. What do you hope happens when you look across your life and you've probably written about it in your book too, but what do you think happens to medicine moving forward? What do you think should happen to primary care, you know? And for the person listening who may be under the radar with anxiety and depression and not having the time to talk about it because the doctor's running out of the room right there, what should they do? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a matter of um, experiencing as a doctor that if you don't identify these problems, your patients are gonna continue to be ill mm -hmm. and you're going to continue to feel exasperated with your practice because your patients keep coming back, they have more tests, nothing it reveals what's going on because it's a depression and, or a, substance use. And we called uh, the culture of uh, primary care, uh, don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. The doctors don't ask for the very reasons you were describing, they're too busy. And then what are they going to do if somebody starts crying in their right. office? <laughs> right, it happens to me every day, every day, <laughs> so. Yes, and God forbid if somebody says, Dr. Tiles, I'm uh, really serious. I don't think I can make it till tomorrow. I think I may have to take my life tonight. Mm. Then your whole day is shattered, right? So um, there's, and, but I think it is mostly uh, the sense that doctors are not trained what, um, uh, what they can do at that moment uh, and where to go to access help. And they need, case managers for people with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. Because it, it is a team-based uh, model that works the best now. So it's not, you know, you as a, a solo doctor, it's you with a nurse, with a case manager, with people who form relationships and sustain them. Then it becomes possible to uncover and treat. I love that. I think that's that's important to get that training going and to, for the patient to be a little bit more empowered about themselves. Now, much of this you write about as well, right? And and what's your perception as a writer, switching from doctor to writer, you know, for people that have stories to tell? Because I think one of the most healing ways of dealing with trauma is to write, to release it. We talk about journaling all the time, but the writing is cathartic. It, it pulls it out of your cells, pulls it out of your soul, so to speak. And it's a way of healing. You know, what's the best way to get inspirational writing? I don't know if you're familiar with Julia Cameron, who did the morning, the artist way, mm -hmm. morning pages. I feel like that helped me write some of what I've written in the past and even directed my path because she has you tap into that creative spirit by just writing, it doesn't matter what you write, you spend 20, 30 minutes in the morning, it could be, I'm a dog, I don't like ice cream, <laughs> whatever you wanna write, it doesn't matter, but you're sort of dumping the trash, so to speak. What's your advice to kind of get to the message you wanna deliver, to use writing to heal? What would you tell someone there? I think you're, you're right. Some people use journals as yep. a way of doing that, but here I'm gonna steal a line from 
my great and only writing teacher, Bill Zinser. And he likened writing, the, the work of writing, uh, uh, as no different from being a plumber. Mm -hmm. The plumber doesn't get up in the morning and say, oh, do I feel like writing a broken toilet yeah. or a, a yeah. uh, faucet? The plumber gets up, she or he gets their tools, and they go and they do their work. Right. And uh, it, that's, I think, a really important part of how to write, which is you don't wait for inspiration. You mm. don't wait to be in the mood. You sit down and write, just like you would fix a, a faucet. And, wow. uh, and, and the beautiful thing, I think, about that is that you discover that you have so much inside and that you weren't even thinking about. Mm -hmm. That the act of writing, the act of putting yourself into the moment releases a lot and just write it down and don't fuss about a sentence or a word. Just, yeah, just get it down and, uh, and come to recognize that part of the joy actually of writing is cleaning up that first draft. It is about finding uh, better words. It is about uh, brevity and simpli simplicity uh, that your edits essentially polish what you've written in the first place. And some people say you have to do it every day. I, I'm too uh, <laughs> um, erratic. Or, um, you know, I write for a while and then I might and may not. But um, I find that it, uh, like you were describing, that it serves the writer, that it's a source of oxygen for me. And, uh, and so it doesn't feel like a hardship. I if love that. Like a hardship, don't do it. Yeah. Just sit down and write. Yeah. And you may discover that you actually uh, surprise yourself with what comes out. I love that. I think so many of us get in our own way or get in our own heads. Oh, we, it's not the right time or this is not good enough or who wants to listen to that? You know, I would say writing, acting, speaking, singing, mm -hmm. you kind of just have to do those things, right? There's no perfection that needs to be obtained while you're, while you're doing it. So I think that's helpful for all the aspiring writers we may or may not be talking to who are listening to the show. Remember, and I'm going to take this to heart too, just, just do it. I get in my own head too, all the time. So, oh my gosh, there's, we're almost out of time and there's so many stories. I'm going to just tell folks to read the book. I mean, you talk about uh, your Jewish mom wants, every Jewish mom wants every kid to be a doctor. That's just like every Indian parent, right? You're either a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Uh, you talked about your professional productivity. You were a businessman at one time. You've really had a very diverse career. And I think the stories that come out of those experiences are incredible and really lessons for us all as we move forward. So if folks want to get a hold of the book, what's the best way for them to do so? Uh, yeah, there are still local bookstores who uh, sell books, and Amazon, this is what the book looks like, Ink Stain for Life, and you can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles, uh, and uh, you paperback, hardcover, but there's no audio. Gotcha. Perfect. No, I think I want, I still make my kids read books. I don't want them on the computer. So anyhow, well, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. I've, I've been inspired by our conversation. I hope others have as well. And for everybody else watching this episode of Superwoman Wellness, remember we are on Apple iTunes. We're on Spotify. You can watch it on YouTube at Dr. Taz MD. And if you rate and review it and share it with your friends, you actually get a free bottle of booze. Just email me at hello at drtaz.com and we'll get it over to you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Be well, everybody.